On behalf of the Northeastern Illinois University Libraries, I'd like to welcome you all to today's virtual book talk. Uh, we're here with Francesca Morgan of NEIU's History Department to hear about her recently published 2021 book, A Nation of Descendants, Politics and the Practice of Genealogy in U.S. History. I'll tell you just a little bit about the book. You're about to hear more about it. A Nation of Descendants traces Americans' fascination with tracking family lineage through three centuries. It examines how specific groups throughout history grappled with finding and recording their forebears, focusing on Anglo-American white, Mormon, African-American, Jewish, and Native American people. Morgan also describes how individuals and researchers use genealogy for personal and scholarly purposes. And she explores how local business people, companies like Ancestry.com and Henry Louis Gates Jr.'s Henry Louis Gates Jr.'s Finding Your Roots series powered the commercialization and commodification of genealogy. Information about the book can be found on the website of the publisher, University of North Carolina Press. And I'm gonna go ahead and put that information in the chat so that anyone who's interested can look up the book. And I'm also going to put in the chat the link to the book in our library catalog so that those of you who might want to request the book and check it out from the library uh, can do so. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, Francesca Morgan is uh, with our history department at Northeastern Illinois University, where she's an associate professor. Her first book, Women and Patriotism in Jim Crow America, published in 2005, is also available from the University of North Carolina Press. I'm about to turn it over to Francesca Morgan, who will share her screen and give us a presentation of approximately 30 minutes. And after that, I will moderate our Q&A with the audience. So please uh, feel free to come up with some questions as you uh, listen to and watch uh, Professor Morgan's presentation, and then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. Uh, so with that, please give us a warm NEIU welcome for Francesca Morgan. Well, thank you immensely. I am so thrilled to be able to deliver a presentation on my book through the Northeastern Library. I have this is a there's a very tough set of acts to follow. I have attended um, a lot of the other panels, you know, um, in so many ways. Um, I'm so flattered to be following in the footsteps and I haven't seen some of you, uh, quite a few of y'all in quite a while. Uh, so it's a real treat to be able to talk about these things with you and I wanna welcome all students. I'm gonna keep my remarks relatively short, um, very sort of question and answer kind of thing. And I wanna allow plenty of time uh, for your questions. Okay. Um, Without uh, further delay, I'm going to share my screen and expect to see uh, my PowerPoint. And usually when I do this a second time, it works. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen once again. Um, there it is, okay. Uh, can everybody see what I'm seeing in the orange border for the PowerPoint? Okay, it says I'm screen sharing, so I'm going to keep talking. Okay, um, uh, you know, there's my book title, um, and um, here's a here, here's a visual of it. And I think that a good place to start is to explain um, a few of the terms in my book's title. Uh, this is the subtitle: Politics and the Practice of Gene Genealogy in U.S. History. Um, Okay, and uh, I must say this is my third book launch talk, and so quite a few of these points that I'm making uh, reflect questions that I've been asked in the past. So this came up uh, the first time I uh, delivered a book talk. This is last October. Genealogy has a history, practice of genealogy in U.S. history. Um, yes, uh, it... it uh, pardon me, it, it goes through changes over time. It's very, very human, just like the humans who do it. These are some basic um, uh, criteria uh, of history. And um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I have a lot to say about the tense relations and the overlap between genealogy as a field and history as a field. And as uh, you'll realize by the end of my talk, when I talk about genealogy as a field, 
it's a big squirming field full of many, many different realities and many different practices. We have a big range um, from the career genealogist and the rigorous professional guild or guilds among genealogists in the United States versus um, people who consider it more of a hobby and step in and step out of it. And you could say the same is true of history with a whole range of um, public history that we have, monuments, building and destruction and so forth, ranging uh, from those kinds of community histories to history professors uh, like myself uh, within the academy. So I can go on and on about these points, genealogies, relationships with history, lack thereof. Um, where do they overlap? Where do genealogy and history overlap? Obviously, it's two particular ways of looking at the past, genealogy through the lens of a family, of a surname, uh, you know, interconnected families, interconnected surnames. At first glance, it's very personal, almost autobiographical for the person I'm going to call the descendant, you know, the relative uh, who lives far ahead in time of the people that they are researching the genealogist for hire that is working for the relative to amass the evidence from historical records of their families. So genealogy looks at the past, historians look at the past, but as uh, you might realize, those of you in history and in the social sciences, um, history historians tend to choose much broader topics uh, than genealogists. Uh, historians often choose uh, shorter time spans to work on with genealogists going over many generations, but I'll stop there because I could really could spend 45 minutes talking about that. Gee whiz, genealogy has a history, it certainly does. Um, and we can go later into history and genealogy if you want to, through your questions. Okay, I'm going to go to this term, other term in my title here, politics. Genealogy has a politics. Well, um, obviously, yes, it does. And uh, in, my, in my book, I talk all about it. And I just want to start that discussion by um, reminding you that the term politics has many meanings. Uh, in my work, um, it refers to institutions of government. My first chapter on uh, white supremacist practices and white Anglo-American uh, uh, racism as expressed through genealogy uh, practices. That's not all that happens, but I'm just saying this is where I start. There's all kinds of uh, laws in American history, both federal and state, especially at the turn of the 20th century, that uh, depend on genealogical record keeping. And uh, that's already been done and other kinds of things I have in mind, for example, eugenics laws that sterilized uh, people prevented them from reproducing um, without their consent. I have in mind the immigration restrictions of the 1920s that were racial and intent at a time where there uh, seemed to be very uh, obvious racial differences between groups of Europeans. Uh, those restrictions were intended to shrink the numbers coming to the United States from uh, Southern and Eastern Europe. And of course they banned Japanese altogether, Asians kept out completely. Okay, but uh, so that's one type of politics I talk about. The other type of politics I talk about is, um, you know, we were just talking about, um, you know, feminist uh, studies and uh, women's studies and interdisciplinary kinds of uh, courses um, in those kinds of, uh, courses in the social sciences and women's and gender studies and other things, you'll run into definitions of politics that are about informal power relations in society, not just uh, uh, institutions of government, but the way power relations and hierarchy play out in everyday life. And my, my book is all about that. Uh, in, in so many ways, how genealogy in both uh, big and small and everyday ways um, shows you these power relations and these group identities and the us and the them in my introduction, big terms, us and them. Now, that may sound a little strange because um, if, you know, if you look at an example of a finished work of genealogy, uh, whether it's an article or a 
book length family genealogy, you're going to notice an awful lot of uh, family trees and things that seem very personal about one family. You can see uh, people in history uh, very close up. They're typically uh, their births, their deaths, their marriage dates, sometimes their uh, you know, education and their degrees, sometimes stories, sometimes not. All right, what would any of this have to do with politics when it's so personal? Um, well, um, here I give a shout to, to all those uh, decades of, um, well, my original field is uh, gender studies uh, teaching, but personal is political generally in so many ways. There's a lot to say about that. But anyhow, um, I'm here to argue throughout my book that genealogy expresses and reflects, we use the term reify, that especially reflects and represents all sorts of group identities in American life. Okay, why have a whole book on American genealogy in the United States? Well, excuse me, I only meant to highlight the word US history. How is American genea the US genealogy distinctive and also leading international trends? Okay, um, the reasons to study um, genealogy as done in uh, United States history, past and present include, um, there are some really interesting paradoxes in American history. Why is it that we have Americans fascinated in heraldry, what I'm gonna call family uh, crests, um, that uh, indicate, uh, pardon me, uh, that, that belong to some aristocratic uh, family or aristocratic man uh, back in British history and on the European continent, but there are some Americans both in history and in now who do everything they can to argue for their own relatedness to these aristocrats so that they can have this uh, family crest on their wall, as jewelry on their person, a book, plates, you name it, all the ways to signify. So uh, why am I startled that we find that in America? It's because, um, well, to make a long story short, all of our founding documents in US history, and I'm just gonna name in the interest of time, the US constitution, many things to say about it, but you will find in the list of things that state governments cannot uh, do and that Congress cannot do, cannot award hereditary titles. We don't have lords. We don't have ladies. We don't have dukes and duchesses in this country. We don't have this whole governing layer of aristocrats uh, like we do in um, British history and French history and um, around the world, you know, Chinese mandarins. We don't have that, even though sometimes it feels like we have a near aristocracy or an aristocracy without name. We don't have that. And yet the United States and Maybe consequently, the United States is, uh, you know, with the absence of a titled official aristocracy that governs, the United States is the first country to have mass engagement in genealogy. First with the middle classes in the uh, 1800s and expanding outward into, pardon me, <clears throat> middle class uh, layers of African American and Jewish and indigenous uh, societies. Um, there's lots to say here about intersectionality, mind you, all the ways that race and class come together. But anyhow, genealogy expands into the middle class. It expands among people of color who have, you know, the, the degrees of education and leisure time necessary to undertake their family history uh, on the page and in the library. Um, and so, yes, the United States is the first country to develop mass genealogy, and this pattern persists into the present because. Um, Americans don't invent the genealogy themed reality show. You will see British origins in my book for such a thing, but Americans raise it to this new level of popularity. Americans don't uh, really, truly, there's this genealogy for hire, genealogy as a business that goes way back in US history. And my, one of my chapters is all about genealogy for hire, genealogy for profit. Um, and um, Americans don't invent that. Certainly you have genealogy entrepreneurs in uh, other countries. Um, however, the sort of the big business such as we have today, and I'm thinking of Ancestry.com in particular, um, which goes back uh, more than 30 years, 
um, that one. Um, this is a, once again, international trend. I talk a lot about um, what I'm gonna call, call diasporic tourists, um, people who in their leisure time go traveling um, to uh, increase their knowledge of family history. Um, this happens uh, with a lot of different Americans. I, I address uh, Jewish, tra a Jewish uh, travel by American Jews to Eastern Europe following the Cold War. I address African-American uh, tourism to Ghana and other countries in West Africa. So these uh, tourists, um, the United States is not the only country with these tourists, but we don't see such uh, numbers and energy elsewhere. Okay. That concludes my first slide. I'm going to stop sharing my screen to see if anyone has a question or shout. Give you a little break. And at this point, I should mention that uh, this event is being recorded. So uh, you're welcome to, if you'd like to ask a question, what I would suggest is uh, clicking on the reactions button at the bottom of the screen and raising your hand. And if and when you do so, I'll call on you in the order that your hand is raised. And if you prefer, for whatever reason, not to have your question and your identity as part of the recording of this event, uh, feel free to go ahead and just type your question in the chat. And I'll be monitoring the chat. And as questions come into the chat, I will go ahead and pose them uh, on your behalf um, in the order in which they're received uh, alongside the order of those who raise their hands as well. So again, in short, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question, please just first click on the reactions button at the bottom of the screen and click on raise hand and then I'll, I'll call on you. Um, if you'd prefer not to ask your question aloud for whatever reason, uh, including not to be recorded, just go ahead and type it in the chat and I'll pose it on your behalf. All right, well, once again, I'll really, I'll really be interested in your questions or uh, reactions, et cetera, as, as they come along. Okay, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to my second slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, um, I'm going to go into the screen share again and go back to our old friend PowerPoint. And I'll be glad to share my PowerPoint uh, for this uh, talk uh, if you want me to, but I kept it, I kept the PowerPoint itself very, very brief. I didn't write a whole lot uh, in the expectation that I would just be doing a lot of things in response to your questions. Okay, um, I have a list of, um, I would say topics here that reflect my book's innovations um, relative to other histories of uh, genealogy in uh, the United States. I make a serious effort to bring uh, Mormon genealogy practices together in consideration with uh, other you know, American genealogy practices by people who are not Mormon. And I'll explain why I do this in a moment, but um, you know, other works on genealogy published before mine where people talk about it from the outside, a lot of times it's either on one thing or the other. It's people who aren't Mormon kind of really not giving um, uh, Mormon forms of genealogy the attention they deserve in history and in the present or it's the other way around, you know what I mean? But I can go into this later, but anyhow, um, I do a lot to bring um, Mormon studies together with American studies. And I already mentioned um, the attention I give to genealogy for hire and for profit, and I can go into all sorts of varieties of commercialism. Um, and I have uh, multiple chapters on roots as a cultural phenomenon. You know what, rather than go on this list, I think I'll just do one thing at a time. I'm just gonna start from the beginning of this list. This list, like I say, it's based on what I think are particular innovations of my book. And also these, uh, this list reflects questions that I've received from others at my previous talks. Okay, if it's all the same to you, I'm going to start from the top. Um, Mormonism, that is sometime at the mainstream uh, Mormonism, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints got its start in the United States. It's a homegrown uh, American religion in the early 1800s in New York um, State. Uh, 
uh, and uh, Mormons are basically pushed out of every uh, sort of community that they founded or that they populated in the years after that. And by the 1840s, uh, they're out in the desert by the Great Salt Lake, expecting and hoping that the rest of America will leave them alone because um, this was a time of great uh, I would say religious intolerance and their religion had these particular features that other Christians considered heretical. Uh, namely, uh, from the very, very beginning, you know, from the real founder of Mormonism, Joseph Smith, who today is considered a prophet. Um, he and uh, others uh, experienced lengthy visits from angels uh, telling them, uh, informing them of uh, various uh, heavy theological matters, including the translation of the entire Book of Mormon, which is the holy book. Uh, so they get visits from angels and the list is long up until the 1890s. Um, polygamy, that is plural wives, were uh, expected of uh, the church going man. Um, the church since the 1890s has uh, definitely um, Put, put it this way, uh, pushed against uh, polygamy, but it's a major feature of 19th century Mormonism to talk about, and that certainly informed the hostility against them. And you can ask me later, why is it in a country with a First Amendment and freedom of religious expression, we have this uh, treatment of a, uh, yeah, of, a, of a population based on their religion. Okay, but the aspect of Mormonism that I most engage with is another feature that has been there from the very beginning of the, the church, and that would be the evangelical outreach to the dead. Uh, that is uh, virtual uh, standing in for your dead relatives in a ceremony of baptizing them in an LDS temple. So um, this approach to the dead is done by living people, and it's one of many ways that living people uh, and you know, ensure that uh, they'll be treated well in the afterlife. And um, this outreach uh, to the dead becomes explicitly geneal genealogical, uh, oriented towards fostering genealogy in the 1890s. And I must say, um, sorry for the entire length, to undertake the baptism of a dead person. And typically this is a person that you're related to, although that whole matter is complicated. Typically uh, you, from the very start, you needed the person's basic information like their birth date and their death date, certainly. And um, the marriage date, you had to be married uh, to move forward spiritually within uh, Mormonism in, at that time. So um, in the 1890s, just as the church turns against polygamy, which is one way of uh, bringing souls along to heaven, and as the church kind of switches to starting to foster genealogy practice um, in this way, and um, uh, 1894 is when the church starts its own genealogical society, at the 50th and uh, sorry, after all these years, when the society piled up these index cards, which were usually, um, pardon me, written and then typed by these masses of uh, women, in particular women workers working at typewriters within uh, Temple Square and all the church buildings, um, there, there's this temple index, um, records kept of these virtual baptisms and other kinds of rituals done that are intended to evangelize dead people and get them to convert to Mormonism. So um, 1944 is the year when the church's genealogical society opens their library and their temple index bureau to uh, anyone coming in. And so we get lots and lots of gene genealogy tourists pouring into Utah from other parts of the United States, um, as they do today. Um, 1961 is when uh, the church does two things. They um, start to use computers. These are very early computers um, to uh, you know, to, to help them along in record keeping. And of course, uh, uh, one topic I'm neglecting at this time is microfilms, but we can talk about um, all this uh, information on microfilms. But anyhow, it's starting to be transferred to a computer. Um, and uh, in 1961, and 1961 is also the year when the church uh, 
allows, at least for a time, uh, these virtual baptisms to be done of dead people who aren't related to you. Okay. Um, I'm talking, talking. Anybody have a question? We do have one question from the yes. audience so far. Um, and uh, the questioner has to be named. It's from uh, Christina Bueno in, the, uh, in, our, in our history department. And the question is as follows. Let me just go ahead and see if I can get the full view of it here. Okay, Christina asks, why has there been an increased interest in this topic among the general public? Does it have to do simply with scientific developments, deciphering DNA, et cetera? What else is going on that has made this topic so attractive recently? Um, this is a wonderful topic and I'd like to put it aside until I get to more recent history. My, my final chapters are all about that. Um, I could give a summary answer, but it won't be very brief. So it's a, it's a terrific, rich question. Christina, if I haven't answered your question in about 20 minutes, um, feel free to remind me that I have not addressed it yet. Okay, um, th thanks a lot. I'm gonna go back into my screen share uh, if, if you're ready, this is good. Okay, so uh, 1961, um, the, the um, again, for a baptism done by living people of the dead person, a particular, dead individual who's usually your relative. Um, nobody claims to know whether the conversion works, whether the dead person consents, but as a living person uh, to be a, a good Mormon, you, you must approach them in this way by doing this uh, virtual baptism yourself. And we're talking about full immersion baptisms, um, not the infant baptisms done in other types of uh, Christianity, but, you know, the, the, the font with um, well, one statistic I saw was 12 feet of water. And you wear particular clothes to do this. Okay, so 1983, what's special about that in the history of Mormon genealogy? That's the year that Ancest Ancestry Inc., the publishing company, uh, get started and they publish all kinds of major works of genealogy instruction of the 1980s. Um, David Thackeray was an uh, uh, important person here in Chicago at the Newberry Library, which uh, from that library's very beginnings uh, responded to demand for genealogy from its patrons and also, you know, drummed up interest in genealogy. David Thackeray very early on did a um, sort of a instruction guide and a work of advice for African-Americans in Chicago who were doing that very difficult form of genealogy where documents didn't often have that information. And I can go more into that topic later, but anyhow, Ancestry published him. And in 1996, Ancestry Inc. developed Ancestry.com. And in the times you and I are living in, and this, I, you know, I don't know how much longer this will be true. Have you noticed uh, Ancestry is trying to become sort of the Amazon equivalent, the sort of near uh, monopoly of genealogy practice. Um, and I can talk about other changes uh, with Ancestry. They're trying to get you to post your findings uh, like you're on some other form of social media. Like I say, I try and go into the present as much as I can. Okay, if you're ready, I'm gonna go into this other topic I get asked about, genealogy for hire and profit. What, do, what are some characteristics of commercial genealogy and what do I mean by it and how do I distinguish it from other things? Um, just really quick, um, uh, Ed reminded me to address Henry Louis Gates who has done a lot to foster um, uh, genealogy practices and draw attention to what's already going on, especially among African-Americans, but not strictly among them. Um, his shows on PBS are part of this broader picture of popularization that's very much part of the mass uh, sort of corporations that emerge in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. However, I wouldn't say he's strictly speaking a genealogy uh, person of business the way some of these uh, others are. So basically my chapter on genealogy as a business, um, typically before roots, before the time of roots, has everything to do with everything. Um, the genealogy person of business has a, a small business, uh, usually one or two people. Uh, they hire themselves out to others. Um, that's, that's really important. The hired out genealogist is very common. 
Um, a lot of times they, they will sell products to you. They'll have a more useful set of blank forms that you can fill out for your genealogical record keeping and yours is better and cheaper than the other guys. Um, they tend to concentrate in big cities. And by the 1920s, we have the first big genealogy clearinghouse done by a business trying to get, you know, enable people to find each other. And the man who developed that was right here in Chicago. Uh, he's all over my book, uh, Frederick Verkus, V-I-R-K-U-S. Uh, he's originally from Germany. Um, and he was definitely an innovator in genealogy business. And another thing you'll notice about these business people is that they make big promises. Um, typically, again, not universally, that they'll find aristocrats for you if that's your thing. They'll find Mayflower descendants um, in your family tree if that's your thing. I don't need to tell you that for some people, uh, documented ancestry is a form of wealth and it makes a big difference to your emotions, the more closely your family background becomes tied to identity. Uh, this is something your successful geneal genealogy business person realized. So we've got Verkus here in Chicago, little slice of Chicago history. Um, and going forward uh, in the 1940s, uh, we have a Mormon family, five generations of people with the last name Everton develop the genealogical helper. This is a magazine that's intended as more genealogy for more people. And they have those uh, characteristics of the genealogy business person. Um, you say to your client or your customer, come as you are. I'm going to make it easier for you. I'm going to you know, make you feel good and help you find stuff. Okay, uh, well, according to some people, you know, you'd say, what's the matter with that? Well, um, Historians like myself very much set themselves apart uh, from, uh, I would say, nostalgia. Instead of putting the past to the use of the present, uh, we do our best to empathize with the present. That's not what the business person was out to do. The business person grew their business, whether it's big or small, by, uh, you know, you want to be able to tell your client good news, right? You want to be, you know, uh, tell your client what they want to hear. And I don't just mean they make stuff up. I mean, like, okay, there's a common practice and um, historians and professional genealogists consider this incorrect. So I would say, don't try this at home. Uh, basically, you go back into uh, research and there's some famous aristocrat or famous person who shared a last name with somebody. Um, back in your family or perhaps with you living now, I wonder if I'm related to the famous ones, right? Um, okay, your business, business person is a lot likely, more likely to tell you, gee whiz, you know, uh, because you have a matching surname, you're related. And this gets really complicated when you go back far enough because um, for example, um, in the history of Boston, where I'm from, in the 1800s, the first decade of the 19th century, there were five men of similar age named John Wheelwright. Which John Wheelwright are you related to? We don't even have middle initials. How can you kind of shrink the list? But anyhow, they'll say, fine, fine. We found a Wheelwright back there. You're related to the famous Wheelwright. Okay, um, starting the 1920s and really by the 1940s, we have a backlash against commercialism and genealogy that's still going on. Genealogy professionals. I call them professionals not because they're career genealogists. We have plenty of career genealogists who are in business, you know, but uh, professionals are trying to go against those characteristics of commercial genealogy that are going to bend history. Professionals sound a lot like historians when, when they're talking and they're reaching out uh, to historians um, all the time. And um, another thing I want to say about these professionals, they often call themselves scholarly genealogists. Um, one thing they really specialize in is the instruction book, uh, not just the advice, not just the sort of answering queries in the newspaper, but uh, this is how to do genealogy. It's a basic thing that professionals believe is um, that genealogy should not be self-taught. You don't just start doing it if this is a hobby that you're taking up. Uh, 
Instead, there's a way to do it and a way not to do it. Um, okay, so if, if you're thinking about hiring a genealogist, historical accuracy is important to you. Professionals have developed guilds. They have developed credentials. Um, I would say look for somebody with certified genealogist af after their name, right? So um, anyhow, we have this professional activity going on intended to reform genealogy and it goes on in many different American cultures. I find professionals among African-American genealogists trying to reform that field in the 1980s and 90s. I find um, this whole branch of um, uh, things within Mormon genealogy, including the church's university, Brigham Young University, that still exists today. It's run by the church. Um, your bishop has to recommend you to, for you to start applying there if you were to be a student there. And my point being, uh, since the 1950s, they've had coursework in genealogy where you can get a college credit, um, not just for studying genealogy from the outside like I'm doing, but how to do genealogy, right? Uh, if you're doing genealogy with this connection to your religious practice, you really want to get things right. You really want accuracy. Okay. That's enough of that, professionals. Um, I'm going to pause for a bit in case anyone has a question for the moment. Otherwise, I won't get to the bottom of my slides so I can address the rich ones about later times. And one basic thing I'm doing in my book that historians don't always do is uh, belly on up to the present. Get into the present as well as the past and treat recent history as history. Um, and uh, yeah, that's another thing we can uh, talk all about. Okay, I'm gonna keep going on my slide, if that's all right. Okay, um, Roots, I don't know how many of you have read the book or seen the film, but I'm gonna quick uh, summarize the significance of Roots for you if it's not familiar to you. Um, Alex Haley was an African-American uh, journalist, um, best known, um, for the autobiography of Malcolm X, which he published in 1965. Um, there's a lot to say about that work too, but I'm going to put the, that topic aside for now. Uh, okay, so uh, in the 1960s and 70s, um, he started doing research on his own genealogy. And to make a long story short, uh, there's a particular set of stories to tell about African-American genealogy that go way back, long before roots, we have African-Americans, descendants of enslaved people and descendants of free blacks um, from all different classes trying to get track of their people. Uh, like one of them said, we have Ida B. Wells, famous black journalist here in Chicago, um, talking about her own grandparents, uh, possibly uh, trying to root themselves back to uh, uh, Indians and their ancestry. So there's a lot to say. For the, there's a big back, backdrop when Alex Haley goes to research his ancestors. Anyhow, he thinks that he finds all sorts of proof uh, for his descent from a particular uh, man in Africa, Kunti Kinte. And there's a Lamar, um, I'm blanking, who's the hip hop artist who has done a song, King, uh, King Kunta or King Kinte. Uh, talk of Kunti Kinte goes on today. Anyhow, um, Kunti Kinte lived in the 1700s in what is now Gambia. Um, he was of the Mandinka tribe, if I'm getting that name correctly pronounced. Um, you will read in Roots that Kunti Kinte was in a loving family uh, back in what is today Gambia when he was suddenly kidnapped and transported across the sea, renamed. Uh, his new name is Toby, and he gets to serve as a slave in Virginia for the rest of his life. And so Alex Haley managed to research Kunta Kinte's descendants through multiple generations of enslavement, which is usually very hard to do because the censuses of the uh, 19th century when we had slavery did not name the enslaved people. They just uh, might uh, list the genders and the ages uh, among the enslaved people. But anyhow, Alex Haley found named individuals uh, um, 
And there are many stories of enslaved people and Alex Haley was go really going against Gone with the Wind. He was really going against these positive nostalgic representations of plantation life. He was very plain uh, about uh, various kinds of brutality. The um, sexual pressures on enslaved women were a very important theme for him. And I remind you in the history of slavery, truly um, every time an enslaved woman uh, got pregnant and had a baby, this was more money for her owner because enslaved status descended uh, through the mother uh, in the law. So her baby added to the her uh, owner's assets, her baby would be enslaved also. So this is a big thing you'll learn from Roots. Okay, so it was a book, it, it was a best-selling uh, book, it was a best, uh, it was a TV show attracting record level audiences. This is in the 1970s where there were only a few channels on your TV and maybe you don't have a, rem a remote yet because you don't need one. Uh, you just turn the dial and there's a big uh, network uh, show. So, um, I talk about before roots, uh, all the diversification of genealogy that happened before that. Um, practices like Alex Haley's have a long history, although his innovation was in aspiring to research back in West Africa and bridge the Atlantic. This was really thought to be impossible. And even nowadays, it's very rare that someone can truly document uh, a claim like that, uh, even though it's been done. Um, excuse me, uh, it's a bit of a scratchy voice. So before and after Roots, um, because um, Alex Haley made uh, the way he told the stories of his ancestors um, who were enslaved and, and, and free, he has a lot to say about uh, life after slavery uh, for the blacksmith Tom Murray, not Tom Murray and his family. He tells these stories uh, for the individual uh, for the emotions, and this means that Roots gets adapted, it gets uh, appropriated in all these ways, it speaks to people um, all over the world, and I've spoken to people born long after 1977 who have caught up with Roots uh, as a DVD, or I'm sure you can stream it nowadays, and you know, after the fact, fact it speaks to people. Um, there's uh, something I should have cited. I regret that it and did not end up in my footnotes. But if you're going online um, and you want to know more about Roots, look at James Baldwin's um, review of Roots, the book, in the New York Times in September 1976. Look at the New York Times book review, late September 1976. James Baldwin in one sentence captured. Uh, the world impact of roots at that time, South Africa was still uh, living under apartheid with the black majority population. He knew uh, the impact of roots for that and the Irish troubles and all these other things going on in the 1970s. So there's a lot to say. Okay, that's a real mouthful. Um, oh, excuse me, there's a roots reboot from 2016 on the History Channel that some of you may have seen. Um, Anyhow, um, I'm ready to go on if you are, but I, I want to break in case someone has a question or something they want to raise. I'm gonna, just going to look at the Kendrick Lamar. Thank you. I'm just uh, having a senior moment here. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm, if you're ready, I'm going to just quick go on in the slides. So we have uh, time. I think I'm at 45 minutes, so I'll make this snappy. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I, I see roots as important for this future generation of businesses of unprecedented size that we have in the 1980s and 90s and now. Not only do they all come after roots, but um, the claims that business people make for how the descendant or their client is going to feel emotionally about their identity. Uh, this is something that Alex Haley was very talented in talking about. He did so much to popularize genealogy, and he's a really important antecedent, not just for ancestry of today, but the Henry Louis Gates shows uh, that are more recent, not only in the subject matter of African Americans, but just the whole way that he talks about the emotions. So I'm going in a circle, but anyhow, Roots, he's really important. Alex Haley's really important in the history of uh, genealogy as a sort of a business and as an entertainment. Entertainments are really big and they only happen. They entertainments, and I mean like TV shows, 
reality shows, even some dramas, all the ones that I found uh, happen after Roots is on TV, not before. Because before Roots was on TV, no one thought that there would be sort of, it was hard to imagine a TV show where someone's uh, genealogy research could be part of the plot. Uh, but it certainly was for Roots, um, especially the book. Okay, quick word, uh, 20 years later, since 1998, we have had a whole plethora of genealogy businesses that specialize in DNA testing. Um, and I uh, talk about that as a historian. Um, what is the purpose of DNA research among genealogists? It has many, but well, something that's very common is for people to, uh, genealogists to hit the end of the paper trail. There's a particular connection to a particular person that you're not able to document for whatever reason. Stories of African-American genealogy are full of the absence of documentation. Um, either records are destroyed or they were never kept. Um, Jewish genealogy journals have a lot of stories of cliffhangers of, of research and how difficult in the wake of the Holocaust and all the destruction of Jewish um, neighborhoods in Eastern Europe and uh, small towns, how difficult it is to get information. Uh, of this sort. So DNA can, it serves as um, a form of evidence that genealogists use that uh, does not rely on text, if you will. It's non-textual evidence. What other kinds of textual evidence can, could a genealogist use? Well, a, I forgot to say, there's a basic part of genealogy practice, and I see this across many different cultures, is to talk to the old people in your family. And you'll, uh, and you'll also learn a lot uh, talking to an old neighbor down the street. I had a student who told me about that once. But anyhow, talk to the old people who remember old people in their lives. And that can be a really powerful form of genealogy evidence. That's another type of genealogy research that doesn't rely on texts. Um, those rubbings that people do on gravestones where you use charcoal and paper, that's also gravestone inscriptions are really important. Um, I guess they are textual, but it's not textual, like, a, you know, a, a, a written records would be. Okay, so DNA uh, evidence can fill in holes, um, but it has uh, some uh, concerns as well, and I can talk about that later. Okay, um, I'm further marginalizing LGBTQ plus populations by putting them last and being in a hurry for, and I regret that, but I actively engage queer uh, forms of genealogy and LGBTQ plus uh, family building. In my uh, final chapters, uh, not just uh, in terms of genealogists who identify as queer, um, lesbian or, or gay, um, it isn't just about that, but family formations that are truly groundbreaking in history and um, go against the past. Um, there's some wonderful anthropological work on 1980 San Francisco that finds LGBTQ adults who are estranged from their parents and families of origin, or, you know, are, sorry, it isn't just people are estranged from their parents, but it's something you do in addition to your family life when you move away from your parents as young adults do. Uh, what do they do? They, um, they say, we are family, like the song. They put together uh, families of uh, adults that aren't even centered around couples. Sometimes it's like ex, exes, ex-boyfriends, ex-girlfriends, whatever. And it, you could say it's just a network of friends, but they do things for each other that family members would do. Even little things like fixing cars or picking you up from the airport that are also big things. Uh, acting like family members to each other. And um, I was informed by someone much younger than me when I presented my work uh, at a conference. Uh, you know, someone in college, this woman was in her early 20s and adopted a 17-year-old um, non-binary person who had been kicked out by their, their parents 
and who uh, was homeless and needed a home. And she said to them, uh, we are family. Um, so there's this family building that goes on without regard to biological relatedness, without regard to blood. And I see LGBTQ plus practices and queer practices really uh, being the leading edge. And when I say queer, it's because um, oftentimes uh, they say them that they're queer. So um, this is what I'm about to say is secondhand for me. I haven't seen it for myself, but I understand um, there's a way to um, assemble your, um, your, your family on, uh, online. There's this uh, um, thing we have nowadays called found families. Again, no presumption of blood or biology mattering, which is totally different from DNA genealogy, where um, how, you know, if, if you've actually gotten your DNA done by ancestry or some such, you're going to get emails from someone who, whose DNA has something in common with yours. That relationship is solely based on biology. If that person's a stranger to you, or you know, you don't recognize them as family in some other way. All right, um, I'm going to stop here. Uh, with my slide, and I will be glad now to um, address questions you have. I can talk more about any of these things, um, etc. So, um, and what's been? I, I would invite members of the audience to uh, please go ahead and use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can click on reactions and then click on raise hand. And then I'll call on you in the order in which hands are raised. And then again, if you prefer not to have your question appear as part of the recording, um, if you appear, if you prefer not to be named or recorded, just go ahead and type your question in the chat, and I will pose it on your behalf. And I'm seeing one hand raised by Matthew. Uh, so Matthew, please uh, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Great. Thanks so much for coming to speak with us. Uh, I'm Matthew. I'm an economics student at NEIU. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. Um, so I was kind of wondering, so is it is it fair to say that family, however that's defined, is something that is sort of malleable and, and changes throughout time, like elements become introduced or sort of, uh, you know, are adopted or discarded? Very much. Uh, there's lots of ways to answer your question. It happens with individual families over time, where you notice just what you're talking about, you know, breaking up and things being put together, but also family formation uh, uh, changes over time, or we have changes and uh, continuity. There's a wonderful history book I can recommend to you. I know you said you're an economics major, but uh, John Gillis wrote a book, uh, A World of Their Own Making, where he talked about the differences between uh, family formation in Western Europe 300 years ago versus 100 years ago. And he finds, well, there's a lot to say, but it used to be much more common for strangers really to board with you in your household and their sort of family. Uh, but uh, 200 years later for the middle class, uh, your family was your nuclear family right? 19th century England and middle-class white people in the United States, it's your nuclear family. So that, those are a couple of examples, Matthew. So we're talking about families coming apart, getting back together through history, and um, uh, also uh, historical changes in family formation. And I see what I just said about found families online as being part of that uh, history that will keep going on uh, after tonight. So Okay. So like, um, may, can I continue? I don't see anybody else's yes, hand. Please. Um, thank you. Uh, so like, um, so as these things change throughout time, is are there any sort of, I don't know, drivers or or or, I don't know, sort of things that cause this that you've noticed yeah. <clears throat> throughout time. Uh, to sort of like help mold or shape or sort of, you know, tip the balance of certain types of, uh, certain types of like, like social rearrangements of family? Absolutely. And uh, I could uh, answer your question for many hours. I don't want, I want to draw your attention quickly to an example. 
uh, of that in uh, the time of enslavement when people could be sold away from each other at any moment. It's estimated that the slave trade within the United States broke up one out of three families uh, of enslaved people uh, in the Upper South. And so there are many ways to talk about not just destruction and trauma, but uh, adaptations that were made. People would adopt each other as they were being transported in coffles uh, chained uh, like this. Uh, you had grandparents take on a greater importance, for example, and this is happening in a general historical context that thought the parental relationship was off. Um, yeah, so we can range over cultures, and we can range over times and notice uh, just what you're talking about, external pressures uh, certainly informing things. Um, if you're a New York Times a subscriber, you can get the New York Times for free through our library. Um, there is uh, lots of demographic type articles showing recent changes in the family, patterns of marriage, and numbers of children among people who are working class and upper class. And that'll also give you a very rich set of examples from more recent decades. Great, thank you so much. That's OK. So uh, at this point, we have two questions in the chat. And the first is um, asking for an answer to the earlier question. And if I'm not mistaken, that may be the question uh, posed by Christina Bueno as to why uh, there's been an increased interest in this topic among the general public and what else is going on that has made this a topic so attractive recently. And I know that was covered in the presentation, but maybe just any oh. further thoughts, Professor Morgan, to kind of recap. Uh, I'll love to pull that together. Okay, um, this question has a somewhat complicated answer because there's been genealogy done under the radar for a very long time. There are in, uh, people right in the back of their family Bibles. And of course, Bibles get published with blank pages in the back where you can write down uh, your information. And people have been doing that without joining any genealogy society or without doing any other kind of things that make us notice them as genealogists. So you might say there's this whole array of practices that happen very within a family circle that history might not notice. However, what's really been increasing genealogy practice nowadays is that, okay, there are a lot of things to say, but I believe that genealogy business people and people involved with popular entertainments like Alex Haley, have made some very powerful points about, like I say, the emotional ramifications of rooting your identity in the present to your knowledge of past relations. In some cases, your parents, but you know who you were back there, who, who your family was back there informs who you are today. This is a big premise behind the DNA business. And so, um, Pardon me, there, there, there's a lot to say about how people's inclinations already there, and some of them are religious, you know, the, the Judeo-Christian Bible is a very genealogical document in itself, you know, the feelings you might already have are greatly enhanced um, by uh, all the basic premises of roots and the genealogy genealogy reality shows, uh, whether they're on PBS or who do you think you are if you watch genealogy for entertainment, if you watch, oh yeah, there's this whole subgenre of entertainment where people see their DNA results for the first time. Again, the gene genealogical kind that tells you um, your, your forebears are in this or that geographical place you know, that kind of a thing. Um, they're beholding it for the first time and the camera's in their face and it's called the reveal. So you watch all of that. So anyhow, whatever feelings you have in yourself get reinforced by these um, entertainments that are out there, especially online. I believe, like I say, Ancestry.com nowadays, uh, there are many things to talk about, many different parts to what uh, companies like Ancestry do. But one thing I'm really noticing as of late is you know, encouraging you to post your results like you're on social media. And you may have read about that when the, okay, I might get this wrong, but either local police or state police in California uh, figured out about the Golden State Killer a few years ago uh, based on some remote co cousins. Uh, posting their genealogy results that inadvertently um, sort of revealed enough information to the police who were watching to finally detect who this guy was and arrest him. 
Um, dear me, I'm going on and on. But anyhow, there's all these ways that I, I don't want to make it entirely external and I don't want to make it entirely internal, but there's this, all these um, sort of presuppositions that people are bringing to the table all, and um, all this sort of sentimentality around the nuclear family that goes way back 200 years, at least. And, uh, you know, again, uh, the big businesses of today and the big entertainments of today make it all very, very common. So, okay, um, I see two other raised hands. Yes, and uh, before them in the queue is actually one additional question in the chat and the questioner has asked to remain anonymous. And the question is, how are genealogists handling new family structures such as unmarried parents, LGBTQ plus families, et cetera? Most online resources assume the traditional husband-wife structure, especially yeah. when generating family trees. You're absolutely right. And the people I've spoken with, and this isn't exactly a scientific sample, you know, this is just people I've run into, um, they seem to be working very much outside the orbit of sort of online forms of genealogy or, you know, genealogy journals and whatnot. Okay. Um, I, I, I have yet to know just how these LGBTQ families of adults that are already biologically related, I, I, I haven't yet encountered an instance like in a genealogy journal of it being discussed, just how do you put their lineages on the page? How do you put, how do you represent their relatedness on the page just graphically? But on the other hand, I have seen examples in genealogy journals about how to record uh, adoptions and step parents. And um, I don't need to tell you that the rate of babies being born to unmarried parents is a lot higher than it used to be. Even that causes talk among genealogists about how you're going to re represent that now in the family trees. So yeah, this is like a developing kind of a thing. And I'll, I hope to be much more informed in some years time. So we have three questions from audience members raising their hands. And the first is Nick. So go ahead, Nick, feel free to unmute and post your question. Hey, Nick. And I should mention that's Nick Chiropoulos. Yes. And Nick, you may have to unmute yourself here on Zoom in the bottom left-hand corner so that we can hear you. You know, uh, I think you. I worked 28 years in the African-American community and and I, a lot of experience, well, in the community and with African Americans. But you made up, brought up when you just recently said that how, when they were chained together, they became family. Sometimes. But now working in the community, I found a lot of African Americans say, "This is my auntie, this is my uncle," and they weren't. So I think maybe that's where that comes from. And that, and that I always, you, you answered a question, and I kind of, through all my years of working, why that was said like that. And I'm sure that is why it came from that. That's right. And there's some uh, recent, more recent sort of um, work done in the social sciences. There's this famous sociological work about African-Americans in the 1970s and poor neighborhoods called All Our Kin by Carol Stack. S-T-A-C-K, where she talks about that very thing, how people will sort of take care of uh, the children down the block as if they were their own children. You know what I mean? You kind of disregard whose family and not because the whole block's your family, that sort of a thing. So yeah, it goes way back. Yeah, and it did, I can recall a couple of times, I won't get into the specifics, where deaths have happened of people that had worked with me, and that's my wife, and that's my wife. Well, mm -hmm. records and settlements just were put out of my hand and had to go to the legal system. Yeah. Because they all, for years, I knew this guy that was his wife, mm -hmm. but it was never on paper. I see, yeah. But to instance, yeah. that, yeah. Answered, that really answered a good question. I mean. Okay, I, great. I, thank you. No problem. I have, I have even more in the book. Marriages can be very hard to document, but there's some wonderful new work on uh, marriage to be sure, among enslaved people and later on in the 19th century. Go ahead. And the next question we have is from Liz. Go ahead, Liz. 
Hi, thanks, Francesca, for such okay. a fun talk. And I have a bunch of questions, but um, maybe I'll start with the, you brought up heraldry, and was that in the 20th century that Americans were getting interested in having their own coat of arms? Uh, all the way through. Well, okay. colonial America and just on and on and on, all the so way. Through. Where did where did these coats of arms come from? Are they pulling from European history? Are they inventing yeah. their own? Like, what are the, do okay. you know what the dominant imagery is? Oh, um, that's a great question. The dominant practice, you know, when you look at actual sort of at these sort of made genealogy societies and the people who hire genealogists, including professionals, what they're after is proof of family relatedness to aristocrats in the history of uh, Britain and before that England, Wales. Uh, sad part about Ireland back when it was colonized by the British. Uh, Ireland had some had the biggest estates of, for the British aristocracy. Uh, France. Um, and I can go on and on. If you've studied European royals and aristocrats, you can, by our standards, they're a very multi-ethnic group. They marry across national boundaries all the time. Right, that's complicated, but that's like the main sort of energy behind heraldry, even going into now. And so you brag about your relatedness to the, in my case, the famous Morgans in history. You know, a member of my family sent me a refrigerator magnet with the Morgan crest. And who really knows, you know, the Morgan's a very common name. Um, yeah, so to answer your question, that's what I see, but there's nothing in American law that stops you from just making up your own uh, kind of cool name and designing your own family crest because it's, it's completely apart from government. Uh, but in countries with a history of a total aristocracy, it's very strictly regulated and the only way you can uh, sort of claim a family crest by wearing it on your person or on your wall is to prove your relatedness to a documented individual man who inherited the family name and identity and crest from some other man because it's very patrilineal over there in Britain so okay that's a long story but it goes all the way through and our next question is from Nick Holt go ahead Nick hey Nick uh, Nick, it sounds like you may be asking a question, but it's really faint. We can barely hear you. Uh, could you speak up or speak closer to the mic, please? Sorry, is that better? Yeah. Yes. Okay, sorry, it's going through my speaker and I was afraid of it to be reverberating, but that's where the microphone is now. So I really enjoyed the talk. And my initial question had to do with where your book is fitting right now with what other people are writing. But I realized what I was more interested in is how the book is being received not necessarily in scholarly circles, but if you've been getting any pushback with the idea that genealogy is fueled by things like racism and uh, homophobia and other things like that, like is there any popular response that wants to keep genealogy sort of a pure science and sort of pushing them back mm. about, against these ideas? I hope that question makes sense and I'm gonna mute again before the dog gets too excited. Okay, the, the, dog, can, the dog can ask me a question too. Um, yeah, uh, so far I have not encountered this kind of a pushback to tell you the truth, the channel, the kinds of channels that are the kinds of populations that are most aware of the book are well apprised to things like, you know, studies of racism and homophobia. Um, it may happen in, in, in the future, who knows, but not even in the, um, the publisher finally got me to use uh, Twitter for example, to promote the book, and you'd think I'd see it on there, but so far I have not. Um, but yeah, Nick, I'll keep your question in mind. So with that, I'll uh, just give the audience one final opportunity to pose any questions if you wish. Um, again, feel free to raise your hand if you have a question using the reactions feature, or feel free to pose it in the chat. And seeing no other questions, I think uh, we may wish to wrap up the event here at this point. So okay. with that, please join me in a very warm round of applause. Thank you, Professor Morgan, for your talk and for answering our questions here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I clap for you. I clap for you. And you can always email me and ask me any question that occurred to you. 
uh, after now, or if you want to hear more uh, uh, than I had time to say in response to your question. So I look forward to hearing from all of you.